Victor spent his teenage years pursuing all the lore of alchemy. Alchemy. Then he went away to college and he switched to modern chemistry. Chemistry. He was bent on secret science studies in the lab. A descent. His obsessive glory seeking grab. <laughs> let's go, let's, let's go. go, let's become a god. <laughs> I'll create life with parts dug up from sod. Homunculi, homunculus, homunculus. My genius grants permission, I'm allowed to do thus. Yay! <laughs> Bravissimo! Bravissimo! <laughs> thank you, thank you. Hey. to lunch today with a good friend Andrew and I had uh, this really fantastic pizza at this place called Pico that I love and then um, and I ordered a lunch a lunch at lunch which is by Maine Brewing Company and it's a beer and it's a, it was a pint and I so I had a pint at lunch and I you know I used to this would be no problem when I was younger and I went back to work and I just sat there and <laughs> stared with utter incomprehension at all of all of the email that had come in and I had no idea what to do. I just sort of stared at it. Probably didn't help that I had had like some dental work done yesterday. <laughs> you know, didn't help that I have some glue <laughs> earlier in the morning. <laughs> I quit the wrong, I picked, I picked the wrong day. Wrong day to stop huffing glue. Right. We have a guest today. Our guest is Sarah Elkins, friend of the pod. She's been on, a couple of times before, at least, maybe two or three times before. Three times so far. Three Hello, times. Hello, everybody. Hello, Sarah. And uh, it's great to have you here because we are going to talk about the first science. Well, and, and here's big asterisk, big caveat around this, but the first modern science fiction novel, let's just say, if you use modern to mean anything after 1500, but probably since 1500, definitely in the West, okay, in what, in Europe, and the American, and okay, the English speaking world. <laughs> <laughs> the first by Mary Wollstonecraft, Wollstonecraft Shelley, um, daughter of Lord Byron, right? No. 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 She's the daughter of uh, Godwin. I'm thinking of Ada Lovelace. Yes, William uh, Godlin, Godwin was William Godwin, the, the writer, right. philosopher, was her father. Exactly. And then, and then uh, uh, married to Percy Shelley. Ever married? Yes. Married, yes. Eventually. To Eventually. Best yeah, Shelley. After. Shelley. Maybe had something with Lord Byron, too, but uh, yeah, there, there's, there's so much speculation about their right. private lives. Right. Um, and um, uh, so this, this work has really informed so much of what we think of as speculative fiction or, or modern science fiction, horror. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I know that among kind of writerly types, she gets credit for this. Uh, I don't know how much people really understand uh, how influential she was, but everybody thinks they understand what Frankenstein is about, and they have no idea if they haven't actually read the book. And so I thought we'd all read the book and we would sit down and talk about it because it's it's not what you think. It's a it's a it's a very different beast. How do we how do we dive into this? What's our entrance point? I mean. Um, Sarah, I can you to help us? say what what I think about it's being a a first science fiction book? There were some previous books that had some speculative things about trips to the moon, like Cyrano de Bergerac, etc. But this is a book that has a mad scientist tinkering in a lab. That's right. that's pretty. You know, he's doing chemistry and not just alchemy. Um, uh, etc. Or at least he studies chemistry. Um, uh, started out with alchemy, so so there's a scientist doing science stuff. Um, so I mean, for some value, I don't know if any of his stuff would have passed peer reviewed studies, but we hadn't really gotten to peer reviewed studies in 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 science that much yet. But I would say, um, it has a much more science fictiony feel to. Mm -hmm to us now, whereas some of the predecessors that mentioned outer space and so on 
were more flights of fancy than um, than something that was even adjacent to science work going on. Right. What do you think, uh, Lionel? Uh, or either of you? I forgot. So there is there's another author. I've, I've read her book. Um, it's not that long. It's called Five Hundred Years Hence. Uh, Five Hundred Years Hence. See dental work. Um, and uh, I, I, I the, her name has is escaping me. But she uh, she wrote. I think she was in New England or she was a New Yorker, um, and sort of wrote like an Ichabod Crane type story. Mm-hmm. May have predated. May have been in the 1700s. Uh, when she when she wrote that, but that that book kind of disappeared. I mean, that uh, it didn't have the same impact as Frankenstein. Um, well, right. has been it's a good question. Like, remade. Why does Frank? So why does Frankenstein have? Because we have Faust, mm-hmm. right? Mm. Which is an ancient story. Marlowe goes back hundreds of years, and Faust makes a deal with the devil. You know, there's a lot of. There's a lot of similarities in, a, in an interesting way. It's a fantastical story. It's about a man making a deal with the devil. And it's about personal, about the, the, the folly of the individual ego and stuff like that. So why is Frankenstein different? Yeah, I think it's not a mad scientist, but it's, I, let me, I don't know if I believe this, but let's just let's stick mm-hmm. it on the board and see what happens, which is that, it's the first really cogent fictionalization of a concern about technological progress. It's mm. the first time somebody says, uh, is this such a great idea after all? And somebody who can really think that somebody can create a human being. Now we have the, you have the golem myth. But anyway, <clears throat> so. Right. That's an and old also, idea. And the other thing I read is one thing I read is that, this might be seen as an indictment of the emerging romantic ideal. <clears throat> so romanticism, a key component of romanticism is the loner, um, the, 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 the lone soul, um, you know, uh, the, the exceptional uh, loner who goes and experiences nature and who feels things that no other people can feel and so forth. And, uh, and that was sort of the romantic ideal. And I and some people suggest that what this is about is that yeah that 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 looks all good on paper but it leads to really bad places. But I'm going to stop there. But I think it's a really interesting question. Like, why is this anyway? Yeah, why is this so famous? Go ahead. I I agree. There are a lot of questions raised in this book. Um, uh, as far as you know, the purpose of science, uh, who's doing science, and what they think they're doing with it. And um, the the whole um, emotional landscape of the time. This book is coming after um, uh, German Sturm und Drang, which is mm-hmm. kind of a precursor to Romanticism, and that's where the book that uh, the creature reads, right, Werther. Werther, the sorrows of young Werther, young Werther. Um, which is a very emo um, story, uh, <laughs> yeah. and um, and uh, the the poor creature really takes it to heart. Interesting uh, fact: yeah. Napoleon Bonaparte loved the sorrows of young Werther mm-hmm. to the point that he took it with him to on the Egyptian campaign. He had a copy of the book with him that he carried all the way to Egypt when they were. French were doing things there. So anyway, why? it was you know a very why? have you read it? I read a little of it. Um and I read a very detailed synopsis because I did want to know what the deal was. And what's the deal? Love triangle, um uh eventual suicide by sad. There you young, go. Okay. Young Next. Versa. So <laughs> right. you know, unrequited love. And, you know, there you see the creature imprinting deeply on this book that he says in the book, he read it over and over. Right. And really, you know, so, so, so yeah, there's definitely stuff going in there. How much Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley is, is embracing it and how much she's questioning it there, you know, I'm sure many papers written on that, but to certainly to my mind, it's open enough that you can have a lot of questions about mm. how healthy is this embrace of the sorrows of young Verta and that kind of romantic, you know, feelings literature. You know, in a way, the Sturm und Drang was 
a reaction to enlightenment, everything can be solved through reason, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, has its own problems in it. So, um, so there's a lot of back and forth in this story. It's really in conversation with a lot of things going on at the time. It's so Um, early. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it is. You're right. And it is early, especially with a lot of the stuff we talk about in the lead up to World War One. This seems to kind of kind of be there ahead of time. But I do want to make mm-hmm. a correction. It's 300 years hence. The author is Mary Griffith. And she wrote in 1836. So she was after, after. Mary okay. Shelley. Um, yeah. Um, but so <laughs> um, where was I? What was I? The the structure of the story, I think it's so unlike what we think about when we think mm-hmm. of Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster or whatever it is that, you know, the the new, I, I, I haven't seen it, but apparently Poor Things is a kind of a, a Frankenstein story. Um, but in some ways, the really compelling bit of this story, because Frankenstein himself is a sop. I mean, he's the, the guy... The, Victor Frankenstein. Victor Frankenstein is is just this, uh, just this infuriating man, who, uh, but apparently he's described as being very charismatic, right? He has the the narrator in thrall yes. throughout, and he write, you know, the narrator is writing back to his sister saying, "I met this incredible person. We're stuck in the ice here in the Arctic, and he's telling me this amazing story, and you know, I just can't get enough of him. He's wonderful." And um, but but everything you learn about Victor Frankenstein is that he's he may be a genius in some ways, but in the rest of his life, he's a total idiot. And you keep wanting him to do something else, you know, the change to learn something, you know, he never does. The The framing of the story is is interesting. It starts out in the sea with Captain Walton, who, yes, is is very enamored of of Victor Frankenstein once they pick him up and Frankenstein starts talking. But um, Captain Walton is on his own obsessive quest for science. So it makes a lot of sense to me that he loves what Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein has to say. Even though Victor Frankenstein starts out by saying, more or less, don't do what I did. Um, right. uh, but then he goes in enormous detail on what he did, what he thought, what he felt, how none of this was his fault. And, you know, and, and, and the, uh, and, and yes, Walton kind of eats that up um, and writes right. to his sister about it and, and all of that. But the framing, you've got the introduction with Walton and his crew in the ice trying to explore the Arctic, I think. Um, and yeah. then they pick up Frankenstein, who talks about his stuff. And then later we get some narration by the creature, mm-hmm. who doesn't actually get a name during the story. And then there's a rapper at the end um, where all three of them have a little bit of speaking parts. So, so yeah. I, th- there, there was a fair bit of storytelling of the fantastic through the 1800s of needing to create a wrapper, like found journals. Let me explain this found journal to you that I mm-hmm. found of the fantastic. <laughs> that right. That's what you mean by a rapper. W A W R A P. Yes, sorry, W R A P E R. Hippity hop and hippity hop. I don't think it's a delight. It's just a rapper. Right. I I mean, that was a fairly, I think it was meant to ease readers who maybe didn't read much fantasy or science fiction into this story. I think that sort of distancing was an attempt to get people to engage in a way with materials they weren't used to engaging with. Yeah, because it's abnormal, right? And and, um, it is an as told to. You know, the, yes. uh, th- thus yes. have I heard, which, that's right. Um, you know, it, and, and the great thing that I thought was really bizarre is that the first image we get of the monster is him in the Arctic behind a, a dog sled, right? Chasing right. Victor. I'm like, well, that's not the, that's not the, uh, you know, <laughs> wandering right. around with his arms in front of him. That's, that's fairly sophisticated right. yeah. and requires a bit of, 
I don't know, like a, a bit of finesse, I think. Yes, the creature is a tool wielding, you know, yeah. uh, philosophy speaking. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, sophisticated individual. Wondering about his own existence. So, of course, we yes. find out later. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it is it is a kind of a work of competing philosophies. I just can't quite get Victor Frankenstein's philosophy, except that it's like he thinks he can do something great and new. And, and so he goes about trying to reanimate well, he does. It's not even that he's saying he wants to create he life doesn't, from death. He, wants he create, doesn't I, really want to say how he does it. He no, says and he doesn't. that's right. And he says that's because he doesn't want to tempt Captain Walton into making the same mistakes that he's made. So he's mm-hmm. not going to say his secret, super secret formula or whatever it is that he uses. But he does make reference to having studied alchemy, which um, Lionel was talking about golems. Alchemy, one of the big parts of that was creating um, homunculi, Mm -hmm. um, which were little servants that you could create uh, to to do your things. But they would be, have some agency of their own. There have been, that was going on well before Mary Shelley wrote Mm -hmm. Frankenstein. Um, so, so, so he would have been familiar if he studied alchemy at all with that concept of yeah. taking something and making it living enough that it could do things for you, um, and 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 then they have that conversation with someone who knows about the galvanic muscle responses to electricity of dead right. dead muscles to electricity. So, who knows what he came up with? on his own from distilling all those things together. Um, right. Right. So, so that's the hand waving. It, and it is, there's no, like I went to the graveyard and I dug up X number no. of dead bodies. No, no he talks happened. about gathering materials. When Victor Frankenstein goes to England, oh. he talks about gathering materials, but he doesn't go so far as to say, I dug up a graveyard or yeah. I broke into a science lab or a morgue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, he's very cagey about what he's done. Here's two interesting things based upon what we've just said. So this is, these are two things that, fu- that I find fascinating. The first thing is that unlike the golem, so it's interesting, again, I'm sort of fascinated by where does this book come from? And where, in what direction does it point? And yeah, we have these golem stories and these Faust stories, but never at any point does Victor Frankenstein want to use the monster for his own purposes. He has no purpose Mm -hmm. in creating this creature. In fact, it's kind of unclear why he does it at all in the book. Right. But he's certainly not creating the creature to serve him. He's trying to prove himself. He's trying to he's trying to prove himself to society that he's that he is this or that really? kind of guy. I mean, seriously. Well, I, I do mean, think there's I a lot of that. sort of. He, Man, maybe you're uh, right. I, I think it's a kind of a glory seeking on his part. But I agree with you, Lionel, that he he never makes any reference to this will be my servant that I'm creating. Right. Yeah. And and that aspect is a lot like pure science. Right. You're going because you're a, you're you're pursuing this because you're obsessed it's with there. figuring things out. Yes, right. it's yeah. there. I yeah. want to scale that mountain. Why? I want to scale that mountain. You know, right. I want yeah. I want to no. I want to I, sh- I want to create life. I bet I can do it. I bet so I can figure out a way to do it. And and yeah, not really. He doesn't really have a plan beyond that, which is right. <clears throat> Just because I can. Right. Yeah. Just because I can. And he really did sh- need a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, but I just, it's fascinating because sometimes the really interesting things about a work are the things that you don't see because they're right mm-hmm. in front of your face. And the interesting thing is he doesn't want to use the, the use his creation for any reason whatsoever. It's not entirely clear why he does it in the book, but I read it really quickly, but it just seems like pure hubris. I can do this. I can make this happen. The second thing that I find really fascinating is that he is not... He is not the uh, remorseless tech lord, you know. He's not. He's some not some steely eyed uh, Anne Rand. Uh, you know, he he's not uh, Harry Dresden. You know, in the Expanse series, who's who right. who has grim determination 
and he holds himself above good and evil. We haven't gotten to Nietzsche yet. He's tormented. He's really tormented. He's he's racked with emotion all the time. So he's not some uh, semi, you know, some uh, some Asperger's uh, guy in Los Alamos who's going to do something regardless of whether it like obliterates half the population of the globe. He's not. He's a very he's a very pathetic in a very pure sense of that word. He's filled with emotion. He's filled with remorse, and he's. F- all kinds of emotions. Really interesting. He's well, not. Go ahead. He's filled with emotion after things start going wrong. Uh, there is not a lot of tormented feelings when he's just trying to make it happen. No, not at all. Um, he's just so, determined. So yes, he's 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 determined to make this happen. Obsessed with it. Uh, secretive about it uh, because he knows that. He might get kicked out of university if they knew these things he was getting up to. Um, uh, so he's secretive, but not there, there's not a lot of angst expressed when he's just relating, this is what I was doing. It wasn't till his creature that he created thinking it would be beautiful opens its dulled yellow eyes and the skin mm. is, you know, it, it's not till it comes to life that he's horrified at what he's created and he starts questioning what he's done. So a lot of it is about physical appearances. To me. Yeah. yeah. No, to everybody in the book, because that's why everybody runs f- screaming from the monster. From He's from, hideous. I hate, he's I hate hideous. saying monster. It keeps running I, away. I'm saying creature is a slightly yeah, creature. I'll word. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the same thing too. The um, creation. Mm-hmm. Can I just say, it? I think it... Maybe it's a flaw. I'm not sure, but but it is true that it in the in the narrator is it Wallace? What is the name of the Captain narrator? Walton? Walton, Captain Walton. We do we we get a sense of motivation. Why Captain Walton is out exploring? I think mm-hmm. I think literally just wandering around looking for something great to do uh, ends up in the Arctic. Well, Walton is really driven to make something of his life. He, he you know, mm-hmm. feels you get a sense. Maybe he feels he would be better respected in society and maybe in his family if he were to accomplish something. And he's writing to his sister. So you get this sense of family and the pressures mm-hmm. on him to be a great man. Victor Frankenstein has a respect of his family, is in a prominent position in society, is a you know, genius by all by all measure. And yet, is driven to do this thing mm-hmm. that nobody nobody is expecting him, that he might be reviled for. So, right. you know, I don't, I don't. There is sort of a strange motivational problem, and I, maybe it only goes to well, this is this is science. Some men are driven to do the undoable, um, but he doesn't really. I don't. He doesn't. Does he say it that way? I can't. I'd have to go back and reread to kind of get his motivation. I don't think he talks a lot about why he had to do this. Yeah. Um, and maybe he never has been introspective on that part. Well, he does later talk about chance and ill fortune and evil somehow steering him onto this path, which to me is a lot of apologia, you know, for that, that I don't take too seriously. I think he's, He's kind of making up stuff about how he was obsessed and how 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 he got into <laughs> this path yeah. that he took. I don't think he takes a lot of responsibility for that because he constructs he he constructs these little stories about how chance and evil took him on this way. It depends on which edition of the book you read. Right. Um, so one of the things I noticed when I went looking for audiobooks was first I noticed there was an 1818 version that's and the then first an 1831 one. version. Right. And so there was the version that Mary Shelley wrote. Then there was the version that got published with Percy Bysshe Shelley acting as the editor and adding um, things to the story. And that was the 1818 1818- 1818 publication. Then after he was dead, she took out some of what he had put and she put in some more of her own stuff. And a lot of the angsty stuff got retrofitted onto the novel. And maybe she wanted it there to begin with, or maybe just having lived more of a life. She was just a teenager when she wrote this to begin with. Yeah. You know, now being 
an older woman with a dead husband and some dead children, you know, maybe that changed her perspective. So there's all these different revisions. Well, I read an article about that. I read an article about that and they said that the, 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 the contention of the author of the article is that the significant change between the 1818 and the 1831 edition is that in the 1818 edition, there is no recrimination over creating the creature um, the thing is that he abandoned it, and right. that was his great sin. Whereas in the 1831 edition, just the fact that he deigned to create a creature is mm-hmm. the original sin, that that's the bad thing. In 1818, the bad thing is not that he created his creature, but that he abandoned it. And in right. 1831, it's the fact that he created a creature at all that he was wrong. So that makes sense that she's getting, you know, it's more more conservative you know, viewpoint, which is like, you know, yeah. Whereas I still feel that abandoning him was, well, I mean, yes, creating him without a plan, not a great idea, but the abandoning him is, is pretty brutal. That's Um, the sin. Yeah. Yeah. uh, I did um, end up listening to bits and pieces of, um, all seven audiobook versions that I Whoa. had. Uh, so I just did it chapter by chapter. I rotated. I listened really? to the 1818 and 1831 first and last chapters. And then for all the rest of it, I just, I had tabs open for the different mm-hmm. ones. And I would finish a chapter in one tab and go on to the next tab. Because I wanted to hear, there were a lot of different readings, different voices, one one audio version had a full cast reading different parts when there's like courtroom scenes and that sort of thing, yeah. which I viewed it as me stitching together, you know, my own Frankenstein from the Frankenstein book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I enjoyed that. Which but has yeah, no relation different... to the book. I mean, the, he, Frankenstein, the <laughs> monster, the creation is not stitched together. There are no stitches. There are no bolts sticking out of his neck that we know of. Right. Somehow he's... Cr- forming parts of the creature and then somehow making them into a living being. Um, Mm -hmm. And right. There's, there's no explicit references to sewing or bolts or any of that. There's a lot of pixel blurring going on. I mean, there's not a lot Mm -hmm. there. I mean, she, that's not her focus. That's not Mary's focus. She's not focused on the science. She's focused on now. What the, what this article also said is that, that, that Frankenstein, she, the author of this article said that Frankenstein is an indictment of of romanticism. That it's an it's it, it, not an indictment, but perhaps a critique, perhaps a second look at this idea of the soul discoverer, of the ego, of the tormented soul winding its you know its solitary way through life, but experiencing amazing thoughts and thinking grand things, and 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 so partially maybe Frankenstein is like, uh, yeah, okay, that sounds all good, but you know, take a, you know, maybe it's not all, not all that great. Um, and, and that author also said that, you know, a lot of the evil comes from people acting alone, solitary mm. alone, whereas all the good things in the book come from families and come mm-hmm. from communities. Yes. Um, which I thought was interesting. The heartbreaking scene to me is, him living next to the cottage and looking through the oh, chink yeah. in the wall at the family, which is Plato's cave, right? It's it's yeah. it's it's Plato's cave. It's solitary confinement. It is it is just it's it's voyeurism. It's like all these really heavy things all mashed together at the same time. I was really really interested by that section of the book where the creature, um, you know, has has he's been wandering around alone, you know, I don't know, scooping up field mice to eat, whatever. Somehow he's getting by. Um, and, and then he sees a loving family and yeah. He, yeah. he wants so much, you know, he had been able to just enjoy the beauty of nature, for instance, but then he sees this family and their love towards each other. And it just starts this yearning inside him. Um, and, uh, yeah, and that them. and how he sort of learns language from them, mm-hmm. you know, and there again, a little bit of hand waving maybe, but, you know, learning language and there's uh, a lot of hand waving. Yes. Right. Um, uh, 
but but nonetheless, you know, just just wanting so much to have that, you know, and that's that's the part where I felt the most sorry for the creature. You know, yeah. I just wished he could have had a kitten or a puppy or something, you <laughs> right. know, something and, to love that wouldn't be so horrified by his. And appearance. what I thought fascinating because you know, after a while, you you read Frankenstein, and you're like. Yeah, this is nothing like the movies. Like, there's nothing right. here like the movies. There's nothing here. And then also you get to the thing that's like the movies. It's like, what is what does the creature want? He wants a wife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That to me is fascinating. He doesn't want Victor Frankenstein's love, which is interesting. You know, you think, can you forgive me? You know, will you love me? Right. That never even that never even presents itself well, in the conversation. He may have just given up on that early when he, Victor yeah. screamed and ran away from him, and you know then he read the the he he steals yeah I hate that. Victor's um, yeah. notes yeah. at some point, and so he reads how much Victor is repulsed by and hates him. Okay, and that would maybe kind he's got of, a point then. <laughs> yeah, he's he's kind of got a point in in not you but know he wants a wife. His sure he want, that comes out well, of nowhere. He wants companionship. He wants a wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, might, he probably would have been happy with that family because he tried to he tried to. Live right. with that family. He probably would have right. been happy with that family. Or, or right. with the blind man that he, you know, that he was able to right. at least talk to right. for a moment. Well, so so that section I also um uh was a little frustrated with the creature. And again, getting into how, you know, he's 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 um lapped up the sorrows of young Werther. Um and mm. he doesn't come up with a good plan for reaching out to this family. You know, he doesn't write a letter and say, hey, I've been doing all this stuff for you, but I'm hideously ugly. Please just give me a chance. Yeah. Can we meet and talk? No, he waits till most of the family is gone, goes into the blind guy alone, still doesn't tell him I'm hideously ugly and everyone runs screaming. And then the family comes back and things go bad because he was pinning it all on this dramatic scene in his head he doesn't have experience. True. But also he's just he's he's got this picture in his head, and that's what he sees as what's going to happen. And to me, his um tormented stormy emotions are very much like Victor's. Victor. To me, there's a yes. lot of Victor in the creature. They're very similar. Whether that came from the creation creation process, did Victor somehow give his essence? To him, or is it just kind of coincidence that both of these people came up with, you know, maybe they were just soaking up the Sturm and Drang of the, you know, of the times um, in Europe, not over in England. They weren't all Sturm and Drang over there, not till not till later. But, you know, mm-hmm. there they were in Europe um, and maybe, you know, it, it just struck me as how un unwell he planned for trying to reach out to this family that he'd been doing all these things for he he didn't really he didn't really try and communicate with them at all until the big you know save me you know to the old bland, blind man who you know it just te- you know again lack of experience but on on the creature's fault part but it it really wasn't a good plan. <laughs> well, yeah. I think if you're looking for like logical continuity, Frankenstein mm-hmm. is not the first book you should read because no. there's a lot of things that make absolutely no sense. I mean, there's a lot of. I think it's very much. I think it's very much an, a novel about feelings and ideas and impressions first, and the plot just sort of fought, is just dragged mm-hmm. along by a chain around its neck at some point because there's a lot of stuff that makes absolutely no sense. There's a lot of stuff where you're like, oh, yeah, right, okay, no, that would never happen. And I, and I think you, at some point you just give it away. You just throw it away, and you say, look, Mary's trying to tell us something. Mm-hmm. And she's and this book tells us something. What is it? Is it 1811? When was the fateful – the fateful evening when they all got together. To, you, you know the story, right? They sure. Were- that was about 1815, 1816, when um, Mary Shelley 
Polidori, who wrote it, later wrote The Vampire, um, right. uh, Byron, and oh yeah, Mary and Shelley's half sister, who was having was an affair with Byron at the time, Claire, right, Claire Byron. something like that. Yeah, um, right. They were all uh, uh, hanging out in the countryside while the big volcano, yep. you know. Uh, summer was going on, so there there was a lot of drama all around them. Their house, and yes, yeah, it's it was 18, about 15. right. Eighteen fifteen, eighteen sixteen is when they were housebound, and and um, she came up with the idea, and then she started writing it as a book. So it's less than twenty years after the French Revolution. Yep, which was cataclysmic. For all of right, Europe, right, right. Um, mm-hmm. and it's just after it just is just at the conclusion of the Napoleonic Wars, which yeah, Britain not long had, after at all. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, I think Waterloo is what eight, is it? Well, Battle of eighteen fifteen is Tchaikovsky's yeah. eighteen fifteen overture. That's the yeah. defeat of Napoleon's mm-hmm. army. No, it's actually before Waterloo. Waterloo is after that because Napoleon gets defeated in eighteen fifteen in Russia, gets deposed, goes to. Whatever, it's either Elba, uh, Elba no. or Mount Helena, uh, uh, one or the other. In yeah, which, which Elba's the second one they got sent to. Okay, well, there's one you. they got sent to in like the middle of, anyway, they sent them really farther. They sent them yeah, like, yeah. yeah, they sent them like Nebraska the second yeah. time. Um, <laughs> but, but the key thing is that, you know, it's really early. I mean, mm-hmm. Jules Verne's not going to come along until what? I mean, Alice in Wonderland is 1850s, Jules Verne is like 1870s. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's right. she's awake when everybody else is asleep. So I read there actually were before she wrote this. Um, there were already experiments going on with electricity, trying to animate dead bodies. Um, there was right. actually in eighteen eighteen uh, in an operating theater with a dead convict. Um, I think it was a lab assistant, not actually the guy who was supposed to be in charge, but he invited in a bunch of friends to watch him apply these electrodes to this corpse. And everyone screamed when the body jerked around. Okay. So that was, that was after she had started writing the story, but there were already people around who were fascinating with reanimation. So she's picked up on a really talking about? Yeah. Is that really what she's talking about? Well, though? It, that may not be what what she cared about the most in the story, but I think it was definitely some of the seeds for for right. It's the lurid detail that draws you in. That's yeah. the sex. Is this idea of <laughs> reanimator? I'm going to hook up the, to a yeah. car battery, and you're going to jerk that's all right. over the place. That gets everybody's undivided attention. But I don't think that's really where her focus is. I mean, I think she. I think it's re- it's just so much. It's really weird. It's it's sort of like the book is like a Frankenstein in the sense that you have sort of this veneer of a proto speculative fiction novel, mm-hmm. but underneath it, it's just the sars of young Werther. It is it is just like a classic neo romantic. It's all about emotions and passions and regrets and humility. And I think she's also interested in how people grow as people. Huh. You know what today we might call you know cognitive psychology. How how do you how do you become who you become? Because she pays a lot of attention in the in the story of the creature where the creature is narrating how it started to learn, how it um, reached out a few times and tried to form relationships, mm. how it um, you know, learned to read and write. How it survived. Uh, how, it, yeah. how it survived, how it appreciated the, um, uh, the flowers and the beauty of the sky the and the sunset and all, and, and how he could appreciate that better when he when it wasn't in frozen winter and he you know when when he wasn't so survival focused um mm. i i think you know she's she's talking about you know the creature is kind of reproaching victor for how the creature had to teach itself all these things because of course victor had screamed and run away um you know without even giving a thought to hey this is a living breathing creature with a mind with a brilliant mind yeah. That you're just leaving behind. And so I think she was interested in ideas of how people develop as people, as individuals. 
Um, she goes a lot into how Victor becomes who he becomes. We may not understand it all, but certainly Victor talks about how his mother died of, you know, helping people you know, and then got scarlet fever for her well, troubles. We, and, you know, she, go ahead. Can we talk a little bit about Justine? Um, in the yes. beginning of the, in the beginning of the, it's the beginning of the book, right? I, uh, this it's is a part that's beginning. kind of yeah. slipped away. Mm-hmm. Somebody dies. Okay. Justine is framed for it. Did yes. he kill the person who died? I've forgotten now. Yes, the monster so, did. Vic- yes, the monster kills Henry. Victor's little brother. It's Henry, right? Right, 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 because he wants to punish Victor. <laughs> or like the um, worst book. Right. right. Fred? He, I don't right, know. He, like he, kills, he kills the youngest brother, who's the yep. darling of the family. Um, right. After... After this, this young boy is horrified and of of the creature and says, "My dad's gonna come after you," you know. Mm. So, so he doesn't just scream; he also issues threats against the creature. Not that that's an excuse for killing this kid, but right. Frankenstein kills him and searches his does. pockets. Thank you. Um, right, uh, the creature kills the boy. Searches his pockets, takes a locket from the boy's belongings. Right. And when he runs across Justine in the in who's sleeping in some bar and having outside the city walls, boy, yeah, right, frames her, mm-hmm. and and uh, believing she may be captured or and at least in trouble or maybe hung for it, and in fact she is hung for it because Victor, that jerk won't confess to what he, what he created right um because yeah. he says no one will believe him but he doesn't even try so i don't yeah. have a lot of sympathy it's, for it's a double punishment yeah yeah um yeah. does that so that's who justine was the um the servant girl who got killed because the creature frames her for the boy's death the innocent the absolute yes. uh, uh, flawless, uh, flawless person, person without any fault whatsoever, mm-hmm. dies because of Victor's creation. That's right. Yeah, and still, by the end of the book, when he's when he's telling the story, he still holds to the idea that the mistake that should not be repeated is the creation of the creature, right. not the abandonment of the creation. That's right. right. Which is That's nuts. Right. Right. He, totally doesn't, he doesn't talk at all about the mistake being you didn't nurture this creature. Yeah. And so it turned against, you know, ev- everyone and everything. Well, again, here, here's an interesting, the, the, the most amazing things are the things right in front of our face, which is that here is Victor. Fr- I mean, because to a certain degree, in Frankenstein is embedded in our culture. It's part of our bios. It's part yeah. of our cultural DNA now. And so it's hard to see how these things are so interesting. This Victor Frankenstein, who has achieved an amazing thing, is a moral coward. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's, that, a, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. He's that's a right. flawed person. He may be somebody who's amazing, who can achieve these great works of science, but he's a failure morally. He's not. And so it raises this whole issue that we deal with every day in our lives, every day in our lives. Should we really entrust this to this guy? (laughs) Do we trust this guy who's got like billions of dollars and runs a space company and a car company? Really? Who are we talking about? Yeah. 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 There's a lot of them. There's a lot of people like that. There's, in fact, they're not just in science; they're everywhere. But these Prometheuses, these people who stride forth upon the world and. And it's like, and then you find out that they're like, you know, they're huffing glue and, and they're, yeah. you know, they're having a, a sexual relationship with their 14 year old babysitter. It's like, what? So Jim was about to say, sorry, right, or, or the, the, mo- or the modern this book very important is the subtitle. modern Prometheus. So yeah. it is right it's there in the title. Um, Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, modern Prometheus. Prometheus. which, which mm-hmm. I think people just, they, we've just dropped that. You know, right. I, well, I that's that, that's a um that or blah 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 subtitle yeah. is very common for literature of that time, especially plays, for whatever hmm. reason. Um. Uh. So so that's that's Mary Shelley using a title that's similar to many titles of the time. So let me ask this question, Sarah. Yes. How does Frankenstein? 
How does it fit into other things you've read? Because I know you've read an enormous amount and you've recommended many books to us. So what, one of one of the things What's that your mental from, universe surrounding Frankenstein? Okay. Um one of the big things this reminded me of was the book Tarzan by Edgar Rice mm. Burroughs, which I have read, which is not again, it's not very much like the movies. Um, you know, it's not just some guy saying ugh and, you know, thumping his chest and, you, and that you, sort of thing. Me, Tarzan, you, Jane. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, right. that's, no, no. Uh, in, in the books, he's an, an, an intelligent, articulate person who le- learns to read by coming across a cabin with children's books in it and, you know, a little hand wavy. He learns to read from that. And he at least has applies his intelligence to when he when he comes across a party of um, uh, uh, English people who, and Americans who've been stranded in Africa. He actually writes them notes saying, "Hey, I'm going to give you some deer. You know, don't worry about it. Just, don't freak. Yeah, yeah. Have some mm. dinner. You know that he at least tries to communicate with them instead of just being mysterious. So anyway." Uh, John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, teaches himself to read, having been a savage. So, you know, the there's a lot of that to me. And I do wonder how much Edgar Rice Burroughs read Frankenstein and said, I'm going to fix this. You know, I'm going to have him actually write letters to the people that he's doing all this oh, good right. stuff for. Not so, just you know, show up and go, Ugh. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that was one of Ta-da! the first... <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was one of the first things that that I thought about. Um, uh, I hadn't actually read uh, the um, the Sturm and Drang, uh, you know, the proto romantic stuff, the German romantic literature precursor to romanticism. Um, so, you know, instead, I was looking at things about the philosophy. I was a philosophy major. You know, all, all that stuff kind of rang with me. The development Rousseau. of theory, Rousseau, I saw, absolutely, I, yeah, Lionel, you I know, saw all that Rousseau kind of there. stuff. There's a whole lot of ideas about there. Um, for fiction, I would say the big thing that popped up to me first was um, uh, Tarzan. The earlier stuff seemed, um, you know, that, that had Victor-centered I was kind of, you know, I, I, I put in my notes, tech bro manifesto. You know, <laughs> Victor is, um, Victor is telling himself. Yeah. I mean, yes, he's talking to Walton, but he kind of gets caught up again in telling a story about it. I have read a, a fair bit of, um, oh, adventure fiction where, you know, I've, I've certainly read a lot of Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, where there are people adventuring and exploring that whole idea of, um, of, of uh, uh, learning by exploring different countries and terrains and that sort of thing. And yes, of course, a lot of it is colonialist slant, but, um, but uh, that sort of feel to me is a follow on of some of the feel in this story. And well, I sure, because you have the landscape's really important. The landscape of Switzerland, the landscape Mm -hmm. of Scotland, the landscape Mm -hmm. of Ireland. There's this sense of travel and the sense. That's interesting. You're right. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating Mm -hmm. because that's very much, that's very much like to me, Vern is, to me, Jules Vern is absolutely fascinating in so many different ways. Right. And again, his writing. Eh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've like, read. I've read some Vern too. And, I've read some know, Vern too, and it's like, eh, okay, go, yeah. Jules. You know, we love yeah. you, man. But, I mean, it does depend on the translation. There, there. You know, he wrote in French, and there have been some pretty bad translations yeah. and other translations that really get across the humor that he has in there. Um, uh, also, um, well, I could go on about that, but anyway, um, so yes, that whole kind of adventure fiction, and then of course the horror angle. Um, I've read Bram Stoker's Dracula numerous times. Oh, we have um, to read Bram. That's our next. That's our next. That's our next assignment, Jim. Okay, Sarah, because we read Frankenstein, so we we've got to read Dracula because it came out of that same. It came out of that same meeting. In eighteen, in eighteen, no. not Bram no. Stoker, but the vampire thing was sure. there. Polidori wrote the vampire, and and I mean there were already Eastern European and, and 
you know, legends about vampires. And for that matter, you know, there's Chinese ideas about blood sucking fiends and blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, but, but yes, the first time it got really big in English reading literature was Polidori publishing really? in English about the, the vampire. Yes. I mean, maybe that's what we should read, not Bram Stoker. Well, yeah, the, I mean, uh, Car- Carmilla by Sheridan Le Fanu. There, there's there's stuff that we could, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, but um, but the idea of traveling, the idea mm-hmm. of traveling to different, pl- the voyage yes. fantastique. Yes. Right. The fantastic voyage. Yes, and I think there's a reason that Mary Shelley, a British person, wrote um, Frankenstein and set it in Switzerland and Germany for a lot of the part. They do make it to, you know, because those weird foreigners to the east of France, France is like us. France is fairly normal, but east mm. of France, when you get to Germany and Switzerland, the boy, mountains, those are weird. And the then towering then, mountains. Yes. And the same thing with Bram Stoker, you know, setting the vampire over in Transylvania, you know, not like us English, though, of the course, glacier. they want to come to England. Um, you know, both the creature of Frankenstein and um, the Count Dracula come to England because it's so great. And who's writing right. these books? English people, the British English. people. Um, I, so I have two. I just want to interject two two different observations about the book yeah. that, I, that I that I noticed. And I don't know if that'll uh, continue. You brought up in your notes about Victor Frankenstein that he is he is what Italian Swiss that he is definitely yes. not English right that's sort right. of an interesting distancing that is that is yes. done with him as a character the mm-hmm. other great thing is you know in in all the movies uh, it's portrayed as taking place in a castle right with a laboratory none of that happens in the book he's in an apartment right he makes he makes a monster in an apartment and the last thing i would say is to me, this is a story. I think of Mary Shelley as as being um, amidst these great people. She must have been aware that she was surrounded by really great thinkers and great minds. But unlike the men that she met, she was in constant danger of becoming pregnant. Right. That's I mean, right. so so there's a lot of promiscuity. There's a lot of basically loose ideas, especially for the time about sex. And sex is totally different for men as it, that, than it is for women. Women can mm-hmm. become pregnant. Their lives can be completely bound up, right? It's sort of like what happens to Justine, right? Something that was not her fault happens, and then she's condemned to death. So I think of Frankenstein as being like, what if that happened to men? Mm-hmm. This is a children of men story. This is, yeah. a, this is a man creating life, immediately regretting it, his life is never the same. Everyone he loves is either killed or leaves him. And then he ends up in the frozen tundra by himself, dying alone, you know, talking, spewing out his story of woe to some captain. Um, That's right. I, you know, I, oh. I, I, I really think this is her dealing with the horrors of mm-hmm. her gender. Yeah. I think by this time she has already had and miscarried a baby or yes. sorry, mm-hmm. started and miscarried a baby. Um, one more thing on Frankenstein. Uh, yeah, he's telling this whole story to Captain Walton saying, don't follow my example. But right. when the crew wants to turn back because their ship got trapped in the ice and they don't want to die in icy waters, he shames them and talks about how they need to keep going on for the yeah. glory of science. Yep. So he hasn't learned a thing by the end. Right. It's about right. fanaticism. Yeah, it's about and, uh, fanatics and ideologues that she yeah, was wanna, surrounded by. Go ahead. I want to. I want to interject just this the song lyric: "Mothers tell your daughters, don't do what I have done." You know, <laughs> th- th- that's sort of like at the end. And Victor Frankenstein is like, "Don't go to the house of the rising sun." You know, it's it's like his regret is giving birth. And and mm-hmm. I you know, so I'm, I'm sorry. I'm hammering the same point home. No, you guys no, have I already moved right. on. But no, no, to me, no, no, this, no, no, is, no. Uh, this is yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. I I mean, I, I think there's a reason that Mary Shelley wrote it rather than Percy Bysshe Shelley or, right. you know, others. I, I think there was a lot coming from her and her views and situation for it. Well, I like what I like. What, I'm sure you read the Wikipedia article, too. And the best part I loved about the Wikipedia article was Guillermo de, del Toro said mm. in, in his incomparable way with words said, 
It's a story about lo- loss and abandonment written by a teenage girl. It's yes. mind blowing. <laughs> it, yes. it is. Yes. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Don't expect it to be tightly joined and don't expect it to make a total lot of sense. But it's about a, a, a poor young lady who mm-hmm. lost her mother, never knew her mother, mm-hmm. um, was born to a very famous father. Right. Who is already a literary giant in England to begin with, surrounded by people who were really on the edge. Like the, mm-hmm. the, these people were really on the edge of society at this point. And everything's up in the air and everything's crazy. And science is happening. The French Revolution has happened. And the world is blowing. And, you know, yeah. we're the talking, kings are I dying. Got, I got two things, two things I want to – even though my brother makes fun of this book, it's a great book. Um, the Birth of the Modern um, by uh, Paul Johnson. Okay. The Birth mm. of the Modern by Paul Johnson. Oh, and, it's got that picture on it. Cool, and cool. it's yeah, it's the yeah, it's the, the the famous Nietzsche picture, and it's only a thousand pages long. Okay, <laughs> but it's a history. It's a history from eighteen fifteen to eighteen thirty. It's a history of fifteen years, mm. and what Paul Johnson maintains is that in those fifteen years, our modern world was born. Like, all the con like before that, before 1815, it was really a different world. And after 1815, it was our after 1830, it's now our world, the world that we know and that we know and understand. Um, and yeah, who cares if he's right or not? He it's just a really amazing book, and I really recommend it. And he talks, but that's the key thing, is that he says that 1815 to 1830 was a hugely tumultuous time. Um, mm. And where the, the the outlines of our modern world really became completely clear, like you could no longer ignore that it was going to be a different world now, especially after the French Revolution. Yeah. Like all bets are off. Go ahead. Listeners can't see this, but the book that Lionel held up had on its cover the same picture that is in the Wikipedia entry for Romanticism. It's a guy on rocks looking over a stormy seascape and the the, cane, book, yeah. the, the, st- the the painting is wanderer above the sea of fog yep. from 1818 by Caspar David Friedrich a German um, which, is, which has uh, been on countless and, Nietzsche covers oh absolutely it's the loner who's having all these feelings mm. when he looks at this amazing violent landscape yeah, you know, perfect for that for that book that that you were talking about, the birth of the modern. Yeah, yeah. and perfect yeah. for Frankenstein too, because that yes. there, there is Victor right, I and mean, sort of brooding uh, by by himself, <laughs> or even the cre- the the creature, you know. Sure, uh, yeah. but what's the famous? Alone. Is it Carlyle? Who's the famous guy who wrote the famous um the f- around this period wrote the famous book about what is beauty, and he said something like beauty is really the sense of awe. Or uh, the it's it's like it should be it should be threatening, it should be not disturbing but definitely unsettling. That's beauty. I forget. I'm sorry. I'm mangling it, but I think that was a big thing that was coming up. That people were starting to think about this stuff. But anyway, um, that's the other thing. The other thing I wanted to mention is about Edgar Rice Burroughs, which is really interesting because I love Ray Bradbury and I, I'm aware of all the flaws of the books, but even so, he's an amazing writer. And they one time asked Ray Bradbury, and they said, you know, who's your <laughs> who's your favorite author? And you expect him to say, like, you know, Vladimir Nabokov or mm-hmm. blah, blah. He goes, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Mm. And the interviewer's like, what? He goes, yeah, Edgar Rice, because Edgar Rice Burroughs was a hugely, like, such an immensely popular author, it's almost impossible for us to conceive today. Like, he mm-hmm. was... He was J.K. Rowling. My and dad had 30 at least of his oh, books. Wow. The it Tarzan was an empire. Books, the Martian books, other books, random books. Um, uh, and, and quite readable. Yes, of course, there are issues with, you know, of the times. A lot but of- also a lot of progressive ideas for the times. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I... Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm very fond, you know, of hugely of successful a number of the books that I've read there. I mean, um, incomprehensible, like like J.K. Rowling plus um, Tom Clancy plus Janet Evanovich, all at the same time, hugely successful, like an empire. Mm-hmm. And they said, and so therefore he was vulgar. 
And the, sure. the interviewer said to Ray Bradbury, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs? He says, yeah. He says, because Edgar Rice Burroughs taught a generation of boys that they could be something special. I thought that was really yeah. interesting. Like, you yep. know, believe, you know, open your mind, be something special, be something different, which I right. thought was interesting. And I will say Burroughs did have some kick-ass women in his stories. You know, hmm. the, Jane, the woman he marries, is, uh -huh. yeah, at first she's, she's you know, wet behind the ears. She doesn't know how to t take care of herself. She learns how. And other other women characters in her books are are also pretty impressive. Yes, there's some screaming and fainting women, but there's there's a lot of there in there that that uh, I think was good for me to be reading. Yeah. So um, pros and cons to that book, but but you know I certainly don't just toss them aside as the past. There's a lot of good still in them. No, I just I mentioned it because it's just fascinating. These people. It's it's interesting when you do archaeology on literature mm -hmm. and people who are massive, I mean, incomprehensibly popular, like L. Frank Baum. I mean, The Wizard of Oz was such a hugely successful, I mean, Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. Edgar Rice Burroughs, massively popular, Jules yeah. Verne, a, the first, Jules Verne was really the first really close to the first worldwide sensation in literature. Maybe Dickens, kind of, but Jules Verne. I just, these people are, fa anyway, I just, I think it's fascinating. But at the beginning, long before this, is poor Mary Shelley. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's something really fat, like she's awake when everybody else is asleep. And she, she tapped into something. Like she tapped, and the book makes no sense. The first the book thing is really infuriating. And it's honestly, a lot so, of the writing is really repetitive, but she nailed something. Reading about when it was um, put out and the sensation it became is, is, is something all right. Um, I think I sort of knew about Frankenstein. The first time I read about anyone reading Frankenstein contemporary on that was um, Georgette Heyer. She's a Regency writer, um, you know, the first Regen or, you know, Regency writer, and she did a whole lot of research. Uh, these, these, were, the, these were very well-researched books of society, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, drawing room comedies holding, and, holding. and that sort of I'm thing. Something. But You're the, saying reason I'm, the reason I'm talking about her is one of her books one of one of the characters in her books is, you know, he picks up Frankenstein. His cousin has sent it to him as, I think you'd like this story. And so he starts reading it late at night and gets totally sucked into the story. And hmm. that was my first experience of reading about someone experiencing Frankenstein. Okay. Sorry, uh, I should have explained where no, I was I going you're saying before that I this did. This Regency writer was a contemporary of Mary Shelley. No, I, I, I um, Georgia Tyre started writing in I think the 1910s, but okay. she was writing about characters of the Regency. Still, that's really of early. Frankenstein's. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, mm -hmm, yeah. So, interesting. Well, um, how how do we land this huge? humanoid of a plane what what do we how do we how do we bring this we should i think it's absolutely to, a relevant story yeah to read i think so now. too there there's a lot going on it in in it that still matters you know innocence and obsession with technology vainglory um and you know human feelings being really important the um, perils of isolation yeah the yep. perils of isolation, because all Frankenstein can see is his family through a chink of wood mm -hmm. while he's crouching in a yeah. in a yeah. crawl mm -hmm. space in the basement. But just mm -hmm. that tiny little that tiny little chink of wood turns him into a completely different human being. It's just like the slightest touch of human company and human society humanizes him. But when you're cut off from that. All hell breaks loose. I also think I think it's possible to 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 imagine a feminist reading of Frankenstein. You know that I'm sure it's mm -hmm. been written about. Um, sure. that this is not a male writer. I mean, when she's writing about men, she's writing about her experience with men, having had fairly intense right. experiences with men. Right. And it comes across. I mean, and the women characters are fundamentally different in this book from from the male characters, and and yeah. things do not go well for. And um, 
So this brings me back to, I had read an article by my friend Sarah Avery, who's uh, the 2015 Mythopoic Fantasy winner, award winner. She wrote an article recently about Paracelsus, who mm. was the first writer about alchemy. alchemy. Well, yeah. specifically mm -hmm. about um, homunculi and how to create them. And it's all about how take the sperm of the man and you don't need a woman do mm -hmm. things with like a sheep's womb and all this kind of stuff, really trying to cut women out of the creation process. Yeah. And, uh, and, and uh, Sarah Avery's article goes on through like uh, 2017 where people are supposedly doing homunculi experiments. How much are they YouTube fakes or and how much are they people who really believe in it? But there's a lot of um, dudes who'd be happy if they could, if they could have creatures without ever involving women. Um, well. And so, so just going back on the feminist reading of, of, of Frankenstein, yes, there are, there are people who want to create and don't, Think about the nurturing value right. of, you know, and I know that's a little bit of gender essentialism. You, yeah. you don't have to have a woman involved to nurture, but women are socialized to nurture. And if you just cut that out and think all you need are the bio elements, you're going to miss. Yeah, abandonment things. is a key theme. Yep. Abandonment. Right. Well, like, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, it just, it's. It's fatherhood, right? It, it, mm -hmm. Victor Frankenstein is the father, literally, of mm -hmm. this creature. And first thing he does is run away in horror at the birth of his <laughs> child. Why you know, is the creature, don't make me change that diaper. <laughs> why is the creature physically superior and physically able to talk? I mean, the, it's like an ubermensch. I hate to well, use yeah, that phrase. It, that's the one thing that's explained is that he had to make the creature large in order to, uh, in order to make the to in be in order the to operate. The organs, the organs, yeah, it everything was, it had was, to be big, right? Some. Frank but why did she do that? I mean, yeah, okay, oh, great. That's yeah. his explanation. But what's Mary's right. explanation? Why does the why does the, why creature, the creature have huge? to be this this not a human thing? not a human being it's more than that and it's fast i mean we're well, going to that right now I, so that right now, but it's looking at it through my lens the lens that i've decided to put on this book it i feel like that's her her idea of what a child of man would be oversized a brute in a sense mm -hmm. um still a child still needs to learn but isolated and alone and uh, and wanting only uh, to get, you know, back to that feeling loved. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that I imagine is probably your experience with dudes. Um, and I don't that, that it's not that it's not. I think if you just look at it as like it's a woman writing, writing a f fantasy about men making babies. I guess that's just I don't know. It makes sense. In that yeah. in that way, wasn't um, possession wasn't AS by its possession about? Do you, do you, did did either of you guys read Possession by AS? She just I died. Have not. Possession I've heard was a of it. hugely successful book. Anyway, so what are we gonna? So where do we? How do we bring this? How do we land this plane? We don't. I don't know because don't. Mary because never did either. She didn't. No, Mary it's didn't, true. She didn't care about cotton. She's not Larry Niven. Okay. She's not like saying, okay, well, if the mass of the ring world is this and, you know, the magnetic right. field, she's, <laughs> Mary's not there at all. Mary's very, it's, it's very much a romantic book. It's a book about the mm -hmm. heart. And it's yes. a book about strong human emotions, about wanting a wife and wanting a family and being rejected and, and being morally weak. So where do we go so what's next in line? I mean, well, I don't, I don't know that we can actually draw a line between this. I mean, I, if, we, if we read Edgar Rice Burroughs, we read Bram Stoker or wherever we go. Oh yeah. Yeah. This. Yeah. Polidori. We're going to read Polidori and then we're going to read, uh, we're going to read Tarzan. Okay. L okay. But in terms <laughs> of the book, Frankenstein World or, or the modern Prometheus. Yes. Um, you know, it, it 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 ends it ends in the ice. It, it, Victor doesn't die at the hands of the monster. Um, it right. is it is told it is told in story form by 
the captain, the captain and Walton, mm-hmm. uh, and why and on yes, the ice? It, and it just and then, the and then the monster, the monster doesn't die. No, the the, the creature says, still out there. "I'm going to go and build a pun- funeral pyre and burn myself on it." Right, and that's, that's right. what that's he right. tells Captain Walton. Who knows if that's what he does? But right. you know, he he. The end of the book is him getting on his raft and you know rowing away from the from from the the ship. Right, right, right. So, so yeah, there's there's no telling what happens after that. I think the implication is him having read Young Wertha, who does kill himself at the end. Probably the mon- the creature does go off and do that. But right. yeah, you know, i I think I think there's I think there's a lot going on now with people creating things for the fun of it. And people getting excited about it, and we don't all know where it's going to go. We mm-hmm. don't know if we're all going to really regret some of the things that are being created right now. And then they wash their hands. Yeah, and then you walk away. Yeah, and walk away yeah. and abandon. I made yeah. it. I made it. But it's not what I expected, so I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, thank you for talking about this with us. This is really great. I mean, I think it is. I think it is. Uh, it, 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 for the modern reader, it's not an easy read, it, but it is a, a, a truly important book, and I, I think a very important book for our times. And, and this was a great conversation about it. I really appreciate your coming to talk. Thanks for having me. I did enjoy discussing it with you all. I got more interested, you know, you, you saw I took a bunch of notes as I was, yeah. as I was uh, reading it. So I, um, I found it really interesting to think about and and uh, I'm really glad to have gotten the chance to talk about it with both of you. Well, it's been one of our more animated ha 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 discussions. <laughs> All right. Um, well, till next time, listener. <laughs> this is Jim, <laughs> Lyle and Sarah saying so long. Good night, Mrs. Calabash, wherever you are. Farewell, farewell. <laughs> Funny Not Funny is produced by Jim Infantino at Slab Media in Boston. Lionel Casson is the co-host. Our website is funnynotfunny.bigego.com. The background music you're listening to is the song Hum from Utopia Revisited by Jim Infantino. The opinions presented by the co-hosts are ridiculous and should not be taken seriously by anyone. Our intended audience is literally nobody. If you're listening to this podcast, you should stop immediately and seek help. Please do not subscribe or leave a rating or review. It only encourages us to make more. Thanks for listening.